Hello, everybody. Thank you very much for the invitation to speak here today about the work that we're doing in my lab in Cambridge. So I think amongst the speakers, I'm probably um, an outlier in so much that my lab does not produce antibodies, it does not validate antibodies, and in fact, if you looked in my lab's freezers, we own very few of them. So uh, with that out of the way, um, I'll talk to you about uh, some methods that we've developed which we have um, used the antibodies to uh, validate the methods. So it's obviously two-way two -way traffic. So my... Uh, talk is going to be pretty cell biological, so um, apologies in advance. So what we are interested in in my lab is the spatial proteome. So that is why uh, proteins get to the right part of the cell and what they do when they're there. So you're all absolutely familiar with the way that cells are organized and higher organisms have got very complicated subcellular structures with many organelles, some uh, membrane bound, some not. And the proteins have got to get to the right place to carry out their function. They've got to meet their binding partners. They've got to meet their substrates, if they're enzymes, and so on and so forth. And indeed, the cell is remarkably crowded. So I love the paintings of this guy, Dave Goodsell, who's from the Scripps Institute. And what he does is to take copy numbers of proteins and then draw out what he thinks the inside of a cell looks like. So this is the nucleus, the nuclear membrane, a nuclear pore, the outside, the cytosol, and you can see it's extremely crowded. So a protein gets to the right part of the cell um, based on a number of different features. It may have a localization signal, so it may have something that looks a bit like this, sets of basic amino acids, which are nuclear localization signals, which mean that these proteins uh, can associate with import machinery and get into the nucleus. A protein uh, may end up in the right place, or in fact multiple places, depending uh, with whom it associates. So this PRAC protease uh, can be present in more than one place, and uh, what dictates where it is is simply which um, isoform of its binding partner, P38, it binds to. If it's binding to this isoform, it's a nuclear protein. If it binds to this isoform, it's cytoplasmic, because the binding masks its nuclear localization signal. Proteins might end up in different places depending on uh, their uh, isoform status. And in my lab, we've shown that this protein, uh, leucine amino peptidase 3, has got an alternative splice form, uh, one form of which puts um, a different exon at the front end, which allows that protein to be trafficked into the mitochondria, where the short form of the protein is cytosolic. Also, uh, post-translational um, modification. So a protein can be in completely different parts of the cell, depending on its modification state, um, status. So a pro-apoptotic protein bid is cytosolic, but if it's cleaved uh, by a caspase, its N-terminus is then meristoylated, and it ends up associated with the mitochondrium. And uh, also protein structures. So the, the sort of poster child for differential localization uh, to do with protein structure is the, is the protein aconitase, depending on whether it's binding RNA or not, will depend whether it's um, a metabolic enzyme in the, mit in the mitochondria or uh, a cytoplasmic RNA binding protein. And more and more, there is um, evidence to suggest that proteins end up where they do simply because of where they are translated. So translating a protein in situ is energetically favorable. It's more easy to uh, um, shunt RNA around the cell than it is protein. It allows efficient assembly of protein complexes. If something's produced in the same place as its binding partners, it's more likely to find them. Therefore, it's stopping off target effects. And importantly, uh, mistranslation or being translated at the wrong part of the cell has been shown to give rise to a number of different diseases. So I hope I persuade you that 50% uh, of the proteome is actually in more than one place. So why this is, is open to speculation. Some of it is to do with the fact that proteins, because of their function, traffic around different parts of the cell. But some of it is also to do with um, increasing number of evidence that proteins have to moonlight. So what I mean by that is that proteins, depending where they are, who they're binding to, and what their structure is, will may have a completely different function. And this goes back to the C-value paradox, which has been around for a while now, which uh, basically saying that as we've evolved, uh, 
the size of our genome has not evolved to keep up with the amount of complexity which is involved in higher organisms. Sadly, there is no straightforward way to um, assess this multifunctionality. So if you've got a series of proteins and you think that they may be metabolic enzymes if they're in one place and um, structural proteins if they're in another part of the cell, it's very difficult to uh, be able to sample that. So my lab is uh, basically it's a technology development lab. And what we're trying to do is to answer a few um, important questions uh, and fine-tuning and developing technology to allow us to do this. So we're interested in the spatial difference between the transcriptome and the, the proteome and also where translation takes place. So we want to know how proteins end up in the right place, how that changes and what the dependence of that is uh, based on their post-transcriptional and post-translational status, how uh, the location changes upon perturbation, if proteins adopt different structures in different parts of the cell, what role RNA plays in all of this, not only uh, getting itself translated in different parts of the cell, but also acting as uh, structural binding partners and scaffolds, and what is the relationship between the protein and its corresponding transcript. So if you look where the transcript is, you look where the protein is, do they correlate in, in any way? And also, if you do have uh, two distinct pools of protein, the same protein, but in different locations, are they interchangeable? Or are they translated as completely separate pools and there's no crosstalk between them whatsoever? So these are um, fairly ambitious uh, questions and aims, and we're certainly nowhere near um, answering many of these questions. But um, what we're in the process of doing, at least, is to develop technologies uh, to be able to at least address some of these. So I want to start first with experiments <coughs> that show us where a protein is. So this is to get, as Matthias was talking about earlier, an atlas of uh, uh, the proteins in a cell, a street map of the proteins. So I don't need to labour the point at all with this audience that if you want to know where your protein is, you can get one of your lovely antibodies, fluorescently tagged, do immunohistochemistry, show where it is. Uh, you could also, if you wanted to, perhaps uh, create a fusion protein um, and use with, with GFP and use microscopy methods to show where, where that is. So these are very important and very valuable methods, but they're limiting in, in many ways. Um, tagging, for example, may direct your protein to the wrong part of the cell. Um, if you're using an antibody, then you, you want to be sure of its specificity, and it's pretty low throughput. So if you want to look at many proteins uh, on, a, on a large scale and across many different perturbations or time points, um, it's going to be difficult to do that. Another set of methods which are gaining popularity are to use um, proximity tagging methods. So here your question is going to be a little different. Rather than the question being, here's my protein, I'm fascinated by gap DH, where is it? This question is, I'm fascinated by this particular subcellular niche, and I want to know all the proteins that are present in it. So here you can direct enzymes that will produce um, activated biotin when they get to uh, the part of the cell that you're interested in. That activated biotin will then biotinylate any protein nearby, and then those proteins can be extracted using streptavidin, and then mass spectrometry will tell you what the proteins are that are present. In some cases as well, and these are relatively rare cases, you can carry out organelle enrichment to a point where your preparation is pretty homogeneous, and then again the mass spectrometers will give you a parts list of what's present. Now, there aren't that many subcellular niches that can be um, purified to homogeneity, and with any amount of contamination, your parts list is not necessarily going to distinguish between a genuine resident of whatever the niche is that you're interested in or the contamination. So the other issue with the, the, these uh, methods, where you're looking at a compartment at a time, is that it will tell you what's there, but it won't tell you what the proteins are that you identify are capable of. So if those proteins can be in more than one place, you won't know what that, what that other place is. So the methods that we've been working with for, for many years now um, are not entirely novel in their design, 
but were first um, muted by this guy here. This is Christian de Duf. He was a Belgian cell biologist. He got the Nobel Prize for the discovery of the peroxisome and the lysosome. And he argued that there was no point trying to carry out uh, purification of uh, organelles and subfractionation of different niches because you were never going to get anything pure. So he argued if you carried out biochemical fractionation of cells, then what you could do is to look at the distribution uh, of proteins throughout these fractions. And if you knew that you had a marker for a particular location, then any other protein that was showing the same distribution, you would assign to the same location. So his methods for doing this was to use equilibrium density centrifugation, where you crack open your cells and you separate out the uh, subcellular niches, the organelles, based on their, on their buoyant density. So the idea here is that the method is holistic and you're looking as much of the, the cell as you possibly can in a single experiment. And again, uh, to reinforce the, the correlation profiling of this, if you take your fractions that have been fractionated based on some uh, physical properties such as density or size of the, of the organelle, then if you look at the abundance of, of your marker proteins that you know are mitochondrial or you know are from the endoplasmic reticulum, and you work out what their correlation profile is, so their abundance through your fractions, then any protein which is showing a similar correlation, you would assign to the same organelle. So using these methods more than 10 years ago now, we developed a method called LOPIT, which is the localization of organelle proteins using isotope tagging. The idea is that you take your cells or your organism, whatever it is, you um, crack open the cells, and these are millions of cells at a time. So from the get-go, this is not a single-cell method. But you take uh, your fractionated cells and then use um, a, uh, a centrifugation method. So the first one I'll talk about is equilibrium density centrifugation to carry out subcellular fractionation. So the idea of um, equilibrium density centrifugation is that your organelle will uh, end up in the tube at a position which is consistent with its buoyant density. So the heavier organelles will end up at the bottom, the lighter ones at the top of your tube, and then you fractionate. Um, this is a Western blot, so you, you do use antibodies. So then what you do is to work out whether your fractionation has worked at all by um, using an antibody in a Western blot to show that you have got some sort of pattern that your um, antibody to your, your um, marker protein is showing and that that pattern is not the same for every, every different organelle marker. And you can carry out side fractionations, for example, if you want to know um, proteins that are associated with chromatin, then that could be a separate preparation. But uh, at the end of all this, uh, you're measuring all your fractions within the same experiment and then putting the data back together again and trying to make, make sense of it. So this is uh, the mass spectrometry method that we tend to use. It's not the only one we could use, but this is um, what's known as um, an um, isobaric uh, tagging method. The idea being that the separate fractions that you get from your centrifugation tubes, you convert your proteins to peptides, and then for each set of peptides, you label with a specific chemical tag. This tag binds to all amino groups, so the end terminus of a peptide will bind, as will any lysine residue which happens to be in your peptide. So all the peptides from your first fraction get labelled with one tag. All the peptides from your second fraction that you've got down your, your tube are labelled with the, the second tag, and so on and so forth. And we now have 11 different tags at our disposal. You merge everything together, carry out mass spectrometry, and we're using different rounds of mass spectrometry, and uh, if a peptide's present in all your fractions, then you will see a mass which corresponds to that peptide. But then you carry out tandem mass spectrometry and you fragment your peptide. You get useful ions which will tell you what the sequence of the peptide is and therefore what protein it's been derived from. But the tags drop off to give you the um, abundance of that peptide and therefore the protein it came from in your samples. So this is what um, a MSMS spectrum looks like. We've got some lovely ions here, which um, various search engines will tell us what the sequence is. But down the bottom end of our mass range, we have the tags, and they recapitulate the correlation profiles of our proteins uh, through uh, the fractions that we've got from our subcellular fractionation. So this is now our workflow. We carry out whatever sorts of fractionation we want up here, but ultimately we've got our um, 
samples, our proteins that have been fractionated, and we want to know what the correlation profiles of the proteins are through our fractions. And then what we can do is uh, to use um, methodologies to visualize what we get. So we've got very, very complicated data. We're now able uh, to uh, identify and give an address to around 10,000 proteins per experiment. And for each one of them, we want to have a look at its correlation profile and then how it matches the markers correlation profiles. And ultimately, what we're going to do is to visualize our data using principal components analysis, which will uh, cluster together proteins that are behaving in the same way. And we know what our clusters are because hopefully our clusters contain our um, protein markers. So this is the sort of thing that we get. This is um, a principal component plot of um, mouse embryonic stem cells. Anything in red here are either marker proteins for the mitochondria or proteins that we've classified to the mitochondria using machine learning tools. If I've uh, showed you this in three dimensions, above it is floating the peroxisome. So we've got peroxisomal markers and proteins that we can classify to the peroxisome. Down here, because of the method that we've used, we've subdivided the nucleus into proteins here, which are associated with chromatin, so DNA binding proteins, transcription factors, etc., and proteins here, which are nucleoplasmic, also containing the nucleolus. We can uh, uh, visualize and resolve from one another components of the secretory pathway from the endoplasmic reticulum out uh, to the plasma membrane. And we've also got a nice cluster which is consistent with cytosolic proteins. Because of what, what, how we're uh, fractionating the cells, we've also got information on large protein complexes such as the proteasome. And here, these two clusters are the two different ribosomal subunits. We can see 14 discrete lo uh, locations, and actually with additional markers, we can see more than that. Um, but importantly, what we're seeing is the steady state location of proteins in a large number of cells. So Matthias showed very nicely this morning that a protein may be in one place at one part of the cell cycle and another place at another. We're seeing the average because we're working with millions of cells simultaneously. And these little gray crosses are proteins for which we're not classifying. So these are proteins that are either part of some structure that we don't give a name to, but more likely they're proteins of mixed location, so proteins that can be in more than one place. And this is around 50%. So we've had to develop some pretty hefty machine learning tools to be able to, to deal with these data, not only to look at how good our methods are and compare them with other people's workflows, because clearly we want as the best resolution that we can possibly get between different organelles, We've also uh, just come up with a Bayesian mixture modeling method to give the probabilities of proteins that are in more than one place, to give some idea if they're mostly nuclear or mostly cytosolic. And also uh, using orthogonal data sets, such as uh, immunohistochemistry uh, uh, data, to um, add confidence to our assignments of proteins to, to different subcellular locations. We can start to look at biology in action. So we look at proteins that are in more than one place. There's a lovely cluster of importins and exportins between the nucleus and the cytosol, whose job it is to traffic between uh, one place to another. We can also look at the steady state location of members of signaling pathways. And of course, it's comforting to see that your receptors are in the plasma membrane, your terminal transcription factors are uh, on the um, chromatin, and then you've got the intermediate members of the signaling pathways that are consistent uh, with uh, recycling uh, vesicles. We've also got can see proteins in complex. Or we don't do anything to cross-link to keep our proteins together, but you can also see where you have um, very stable complexes that members of the components of the complex sit on top of one another down here, for example, in yellow, we've got components of uh, EIF3, which is um, involved in translation. And we can see proteins as well, um, as I said earlier, that are in different places depending on their alternative splicing status. So this is back to lap three, the uh, long isoform, which associates in the mitochondria, and the short isoform, which is in an intermediate position between the plasma membrane and the, and the cytosol. So we need to be able to capture dynamic events. Um, so just briefly, this isn't published. But if we treat protein, uh, cells in different ways, and these were um, 
a, a monocytic cell line, which we, we treated with lipopolysaccharide, we can look at uh, to see what's changing in set, with sets of proteins uh, in terms of their location. So there are certain different features that you would like to see. So, for example, sets of proteins that uh, appear because you've treated the cells in some way, so these are now expressed given the perturbation. Proteins that don't change, so proteins even those that are in more than one place, that remain in more than one place, but also proteins that are moving. So this uh, example I'm showing here is protein kinase C-alpha, which relocates from the cytoplasm to the plasma membrane, and the transcription factor STAT6, which moves from the cytoplasm into the nucleus. So the methods are consistent and reproducible enough to pick up changes of proteins moving from, from A to B. Now, we've, over the years, had to prove and show that our methods are um, valid and that they, they make sense and that what we're not doing, particularly in, in terms of proteins that are in more than one place, is simply picking this up as an artifact of the, the methods that we're using to fractionate the cells. So many years ago, we talked uh, with uh, Matthias's colleague, Emma Lumberg, and her team about if we were going to use a new cell line, what would be the preferred cell line from them so that we could compare our data with a large amount of uh, beautiful images that Matthias alluded to this morning. So Emma's favorite cell line at the time was U2OS. So what she did was to supply us with this cell line and also the conditions that they'd used to grow them in their uh, large-scale imaging study. So we got our equivalent LOPIT map. Uh, this was work by um, Katerina Galadaki, and then had the job of using our machine learning tools to classify where we thought proteins were in the cell. And then came uh, the, uh, the, the, mouth, the mouth in our hearts, hearts in our mouth moment, which was to compare our classifications with Emma and her team's classifications. So these are completely orthogonal methods. She's got single cells and they're intact. We've got millions of cells that we hack to pieces and hope that the proteins stay in the right place. Interestingly, she also thinks from their data that half the proteins are in more than one place. So what we showed was, was astonishing, and I don't think at the outset that we ever imagined that there would be such great amounts of agreement. So for certain subcellular locations, the agreement is eye-watering, and that particularly is for the endoplasmic reticulum and the mitochondria. There are uh, some places where we don't agree, but that, to some extent, is to do with, with nomenclature. So Emma calls things vesicles, where we might have some idea because of uh, sets of proteins which are, are clustering together, what those vesicles may be. She was also able to see uh, subcellular structures that we had no idea that we had any sort of resolution in our data. For example, when we took her nucleola uh, proteins, or proteins that she thought were nucleola from her imaging, we could then see within our nucleoplasma cluster that we'd actually got a, a subcluster, and these nuclear, nucleola proteins were clustering very nicely together in our data. And um, it's also um, interesting to see that where some of the antibodies Emma was less confident with and some of the antibodies she was more confident with, that our agreement scaled with that confidence. So the, the more confident that she was in the, uh, the targets of the antibody and their reliability, the more there was with agreement with, with our data. When we have a look at um, overlap with proteins that we think are in uh, more than one place, then this also uh, was, we were able to see uh, the same sorts of structure and detail in, in Emma's data set. And importantly, when we then um, merged our data with their data, we could carry out uh, different types of classification. And to cut a long story short, using um, the F1 macros, we were able to see uh, that we improved classification and reproducibility by combining these two very different data sets together. So since this time, we've uh, increased our LOPIT repertoire. These are three different workflows. In fact, we've got five different workflows that we now uh, use in the lab. They're there for, for different reasons. The one that I've described using density centrifugation, sorry, equilibrium density centrifugation gives us uh, the maximum resolution. We have a method which is based solely on differential centrifugation. Uh, it's easier, doesn't require as, many, as much sample size, but we take a hit on resolution. 
And we have a new method uh, where the idea is to try and maintain RNA integrity. So not only can we get a map of where the proteins are in the cell, but also a map of where the transcripts are in the cell. Again, to see the commonality of uh, transcript and proteins that correspond to one another in the same place and those that don't. The code names in the lab uh, for these, mostly to do with uh, their ease of use, is uh, Rolls-Royce, Ford Focus, and Skateboard. <laughs> and they require different amounts of cells, different amounts of times. The, the rate-limiting step for all of them is mass spectrometry, and the rate-limiting step after you've done that is uh, the um, data analysis and applying the machine learning tools. But just to show you the difference between our LOPIC DC workflow, which we um, are just about to submit, and our hyperlopic workflow, by the time we've carried out the two different types of different, uh, centrifugation, we're still using the, dame, the same downstream quantitation methods of mass spectrometry, and importantly, the same uh, types of machine learning. And these for the same cells, so this again is U2 OS. You can see that we've, we've got better resolution uh, with hyperlopit, but if you look at the overall structures, there's still a lot of commonality uh, between, between the two. Um, what it's important to show is that where you think that you, have, that you know biology, because uh, the textbooks, Albert and Stryer and Leninger, tell you where, where metabolism, for example, takes place, this is not necessarily uh, the case. So when we look, for example, at glycolysis and gluconeogenesis, which I was always told was cytosolic, those enzymes do come out as being cytosolic, but a proportion of them are in more than one place. And when you have a look what they are, it's intriguing to see that these are the proteins which uh, control flux through these pathways. So it may be, who knows, that one of the ways of actually controlling, sort of a crude way of controlling flux through pathways, is to simply move the important rate-limiting um, enzymes out of the way. So just finally, and I'm doing this because he said he wanted to know what the acronym meant. We want to capture the RNA as well. And we want to capture the RNA binding proteins, uh, which, we are, um, which are very important at, at um, locating RNA to the right part of the cell. RNA is a very um, delicate molecule. It's never allowed out on its own. It's coordinated by proteins. So can we fish out the RNA binding proteome? So... Um, the way that it's done at the moment is to cross-link with UV, protein to RNA, and then pull out the RNA based on its poly A tail. Now, not all RNA has got a poly A tail, and this also requires uh, far too many cells, this many, if we were going to try and combine this method with LOPIT. So we've got this many cells down to half of one of these with our new method. The method's called OOPS, or Orthogonal Organic Phase Separation. We tried to call it something more sensible, but well, once it was called that, it uh, stuck. And it's so easy, it's untrue. So if nothing else, I will share this easy method with you. So the idea is that if any of you have worked with RNA, you know that the way that you um, purify it from your cells is to use the triazol reagent. So the triazol reagent, uh, when combined with chloroform, will partition. RNA goes into the aqueous. Protein goes into the organic. If you cross-link them together then they end up at the interface. And they end up not only at the interface, but if you take them through multiple rounds of this triazol chloroform extraction, which is super simple, that you end up with very pure RNA bound uh, to protein. So the very interface that the protocols say, do not touch this interface, actually has got a large number of RNA binding proteins bound to um, RNA anyway. But after cross-linking, it becomes a, a very, very enriched fraction. So I won't go through all this other than to say that when we do mass spectrometry on the uh, proteins that sort of pulled out, that makes some sort of sense, but also adds to the list of proteins that we know bind RNA. Um, we can have a look at the binding domains, and this is the message I want to get over, I suppose, is that there is an awful lot of RNA binding proteins that seem to be able to bind RNA without having um, a canonical RNA binding um, sequence. We, by combining different proteases with ways of fishing out um, peptides that contain um, RNA, after you've uh, chopped with RNAs, you still get sort of a nub of, of RNA present, which is going to be phosphorylated. We can actually work out the binding sites of where the RNA is on some of these unusual proteins. Many of these binding sites seem to map with domains of proteins which are targets for drugs. So I think that is uh, an important message. Some of them make perfect sense. 
Some of them are surprising. And when we uh, did, because the method is so simple and we don't need very many uh, cells to be able to do this, we were able to map RNA binding proteins through the cell cycle, or at least through cell cycle arrest and release. And what we showed was that the good old glycolytic enzymes, which I've banged on around about uh, already, are bi RNA binding proteins. Some of them were known to be, very few of them shown to be in um, vi vivo. And we've shown that basically all of them are. And because the method's so simple, we've gone right back through evolution, looking at Arabidopsis and Drosophila and yeast, all the way to E. coli. And E. e. coli, they bind RNA as well. So this feature has been around a long time. During cell cycle arrest, they step back. When you then uh, take the cells uh, and, and unarrest them, they become RNA binding proteins again. And because we can map the structures, we can see, for example, gap DH, where the RNA is binding, and the fact that this is mapping to its uh, coenzyme uh, binding site and its Rossman fold. And we can now, because we don't need very much material, we can now combine it with uh, the Loppet method <laughs> to show the subcellular location of the, uh, these RNA binding proteins, which seem to be in many, many, many different compartments of the, of the cell and not just confined to the cytosol and the nucleus. So um, many messages I hope I've got over. Uh, importantly, half the proteome seems to be in more than one place. The OOPS method is a stupid name, but at least it's quick and flexible and allows you to retrieve RNA binding proteins from very small sample sizes, which means there's a lot of cell biology which can now be uh, studied and unearthed. Um, and I think these are the messages that I put in a jet lag state on the train yesterday. The subcellular targets of antibodies, um, a validation would be to com compare with, with what we find using a very, very orthogonal method. 50% of proteins are of no fixed abode, and so if there are multiple signals in IHC, then that makes some sort of sense. Therapeutic targets, um, if your protein is a moonlighter, then you might think that your therapeutic target is going to knock out one feature of that protein, but actually it may be knocking out um, activity that you don't know about and is, and is essential to the cell. And I think we've, we, well, we've shown, but I haven't shown you in any detail, that RNA uh, binding capacity is uh, much greater than, than imagined in um, proteins and also in some, in some cases maps to sites for which uh, drug targets have been designed against. So here's my lab. There's a lot of them. If they're in red, they're informaticians. If they're in uh, blue, they're not. <laughs> We have uh, lots of uh, collaborators here, there, and everywhere, and uh, most of the work that I've presented <coughs> today has been funded by the Wellcome Trust. Thank you very much for your attention. It's, it's completely elegant and, and, and fantastic work. We, the briefest of brief questions. Please. Um, I wonder, um, how does your rationalization work with well, change on the principle We don't use detergent when we fractionate the cells because if we did, um, the organelle integrity might be um, impacted. And if that were the case, then that would impact the behaviour of the organelles in our differ differential centrifugation methods. What we have done previously, um, certainly in our uh, early... So our reason for being was to map membrane proteins in the Golgi apparatus in plants. That's how we started out uh, 15 years ago. It's quite a difficult thing to do because plants are horrible. Uh, very difficult to crack the cells open. And there, because we were only interested in membrane proteins, what we did once we'd fractionated was to um, use carbonate washing to fish off any peripherally associated proteins. So what we ended up with then were very meaty proteins with transmembrane spanning regions. At that point, we had to use a lot of detergent to try and solubilize them. But we certainly don't use them at the point of um, fractionating the cells, because if we did, we'd lose all the different um, densities and sizes of the organelles, which are the very things that we're separating upon. <laughs>